Welcome to another of my talks. How to approach the current fighting between Israel and Hamas. The history and politics of the Middle East, or West Asia, is extremely complicated and confusing. Indeed, I know historians who have been specialists on the region for decades, and even they can find their work exceptionally trying at times. Suffice to say, if you are not familiar with the dynamics of the Middle East and want to acquire an all-round basic understanding of the region, then you will have to knuckle down and carry out extensive reading of primary and secondary source materials. And I should not have to say the following, but I am compelled to because of the staggering amount of ignorant, lazy imbeciles out there. So here goes. Watching Sky News or CNN or listening to Times Radio or LBC News or reading the Daily Telegraph or the Times is not a way of educating yourself about the Middle East. And anyone who does turn to Western mainstream media does so because they are idle, gullible, brainwashed fools. Now, concerning the current fighting between the Israelis and Hamas. Those who say that it was impossible for a few hundred Hamas fighters to break through Israel's defense fortifications with Gaza are ignorant of military affairs. Whilst the Israel Defense Forces, IDF, are a formidable force and are one of the best trained forces in the world, nonetheless, the myth of Israeli invincibility is just that, a myth. The myth was born following Israel's exceptionally clinical victory against three Arab armies combined, Egypt's, Syria's and Jordan's, in just six days in 1967. Stunning that the Israeli victory was, nevertheless, it was more on account of Arab ineptitude on the battlefield rather than the notion of Israeli invincibility. That reality would be brutally exposed for Israel in the next Israeli-Arab war in 1973. The performance of the Egyptian armed forces in 1973 convinced many in the Israeli military establishment that Israel would not again be able to defeat Egypt in a war. And it was this realization which played a major role in Israel agreeing to the Camp David Accords with Egypt in 1978, which shortly led to a peace treaty between Israel and Egypt in 1979. But returning to the present day fighting between the Israelis and Hamas, it is more than possible for Hamas to have identified a weakness in Israel's defense fortifications and to have brutally exploited this. And it is more than possible for a few hundred Hamas fighters who are well-trained, well-equipped, well-motivated and tenacious to have punched a hole in the Israeli defense fortifications, to have advanced through the hole and to have been followed by additional Hamas fighters. Further to that, the fighting between the IDF and Hamas does not demonstrate that the capabilities of the IDF have deteriorated. Instead, the fighting reveals that the capacity for, for offensive warfare by Hamas has increased exponentially as it has with Hezbollah. Also, Hamas's intelligence wing has clearly attained a very competent level. So, with all of that in mind, an inevitable question is, could Israeli military intelligence and Mossad have failed to learn of Hamas's intentions? The answer is an unequivocal yes. The myth of Israeli invincibility is just that, a myth. Intelligence agencies across the world can and do fail in tasks which are assigned to them. 
and Israeli intelligence is no different. Now, a more pertinent question is as follows. Could the Israeli establishment, knowing of Hamas's plan, have allowed it to go ahead so that this would provide Israel with a pretext for taking a specific and unprecedented course of action in Gaza? The answer is that it is conceivable. The follow-up question has to be, therefore, what action could Israel now take in Gaza? One possibility could be an all-out ground invasion of Gaza by the Israeli army, with the aim of annexing this territory and later on inhabiting it with Jewish settlers. Again, it is possible. I am not saying probable. Now, at the start of this talk, I said how extremely complicated the history and politics of the Middle East is. In the context of the current fighting between the Israelis and Hamas, here are some points for you to reflect on. Firstly, note how neither Al-Qaeda nor ISIS has praised Hamas's military actions. That becomes all the more telling when one considers that neither Al-Qaeda nor ISIS have ever attacked Israel or even threatened to attack Israel. And that becomes ever more telling when one considers that during the war in Syria, Al-Qaeda fighters who had been wounded in battle with the Syrian army were treated by Israeli doctors in Israeli hospitals and were then sent back into Syria to wage war on the Syrian people. In 2018, I had a bitter exchange with a retired Israeli ambassador on television regarding Israel and Al-Qaeda. I will post a link to this debate in the comments section of this video. Secondly, it is believed that Israel helped Hamas come to power in Gaza in 2007, so as to split the Palestinian people. Previous to Hamas's coming to power, the Palestinian people had been united under Fatah. Thirdly, and following on from the last point, it is believed that some of the Hamas leadership are in the pockets, so to speak, of the Israelis. And fourthly, when the Western-backed Islamist uprising began in Syria in 2011, Hamas severed diplomatic relations with the Syrian government, which has, for well over half a century, been an ardent friend to Palestine. Given that Hamas is a Muslim Brotherhood affiliate, and that the uprising in Syria was essentially a Muslim Brotherhood stroke Salafist one, Hamas's severing of relations with Damascus was not a surprise. Now, I would like to comment on some of the words and actions at recent pro-Palestine rallies in the Western world, from America to Canada, to Britain, to continental Europe, to Australia. It is deeply regrettable that some unsavory people and organizations have attached themselves to the Palestinian cause, and I am specifically referring to Islamists. However, the presence of Islamists in the Western world is the result of mass immigration. When people from outside of the Western world are imported into the Western world, they not only bring with them cultures which are incompatible to those of the Western world, but they also bring with them their politics and regional troubles. That is why mass immigration must be stopped and completely reversed. Otherwise, the whole of the Western world 
will come to resemble Sweden, a country which, prior to mass immigration, had been one of the most harmonious, safe, and peaceful of societies in the world. Today, as a consequence of mass immigration, Swedish society is the complete and utter opposite of what it once was. And let us be aware that mass immigration, including its illegal variant, has been engineered by the Western ruling elites. Thank you ever so much for your time and for listening.